them around what's, what are our specialties, what are the things we're involved in. Those are the signals that allow us to better self-organize and trying to really look at that and figure out what are the ways that, and you know, thinking about the badges and things like that, if we can find a functional way for them to be easily visible. Um, there's an element that they have that's purely like fun and motivational, but there's another whole function that they serve, which is similar to the function that, that, that they often serve in the military. If, you know, if somebody has an NLP badge, and like, I'll just make this up, but they've got an NLP badge and it's gold, uh, and that lets us know, okay, this is a person who's like a veteran, fully understands this, they're, you know, this is, this is Slava, or like this, this is someone yeah. who's working at that level. Um, it's that, especially that, super important for newcomers that are like, yeah. who are these people? Right. <laughs> Yeah, and just learning how to navigate around that. And, and looking at the different, the speed of the different channels we use and the ways that information and blockages accumulate there. So, you know, slack, because someone was, there was a conversation going on on a Trello card, for example, the other day. And so, you know, just talking to the folks, it was like, yeah, like Slack is the, is the place for this. Slack is the best place for us to be having those kind of conversations. But having Slack as like the rapid, the, those rapid communications that are happening, when that gets to the point where there's something useful to do about it, that's where it goes on to Trello. Um, when it gets to the point where there's anything we need to actually aggregate in terms of information, that's where it goes onto a Google Doc or onto a onto yeah. kind of a spreadsheet or something. And then when it's something that it's turning into an actual machine code problem, that's where Kaggle Notebooks and, and GitHub kind of come in. And really just trying to map that out yeah. will help people know where to go for what. Yeah, much needed structure. And we're finally at the point when we have time to do that, you know, versus yeah. the first uh, sprint. So that's, yeah. that's great. Um, also, like the ant colony, like idea and the emergence is such a powerful idea. And I actually like, because as you can imagine, I was struggling not working. Like the, right. that was yeah. a, a real thing, especially after a month of like continuous brain usage. I like even that article was my like attempt to do something useful, but not like hard work. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah your relaxation is writing an article about all the stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which was helpful, you know, I, I really like offloaded my board and, and, and energy. Um, but what I was saying is, um, like I actually stumbled upon this paper that is has a weird title. Um, it has a, a title called "The Information Theory of Individuality," okay. and it's very deep and complex. And it's actually like technological approach to biology, in yeah. a way. But it's really awesome because, like, you won't believe it, but I stumbled upon this article. Um, like probably like 20 hours after posting that uh, message to Slack and uh, the one where I said, you know, the, the, um, we are bigger than the sum of uh, the parts. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what this article is about. And I'm like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I read it and it's, it's, there is something in there. And, and the fact that we are creating some structure that produces more of like of its own. And I actually started thinking about like, what are the different analogies like Anne's colony to try to hit as many different people, different backgrounds as possible, because mm -hmm. there are some people that really resonate with an Anne's colony thing, right? Some are like, eh, I don't right. know, I don't get. It. Uh, but there are other analogies, like the one that I was trying to uh, talk about on the daily call today is through the prism of addressing manual and task geo is the fact that we're kind of operating like fractals. Mm -hmm. And in a way, you can clearly see when the fractal grows like too big and then it starts like branching yeah, out. It bifurcates. And, yeah. Yeah, and there is a science to it, and we're kind of observing it and empirically optimizing that. But basically, if that, uh, that's something that branches out, has enough momentum, and momentum can be, you know, a mix of structure and a team leader, you know, that leads that, that has some yeah. lags to, to be developed in the, you know, fully functional um, cell but if it doesn't it will quickly die off so it's like 
Yeah. You need to find that balance and also establish processes to quickly understand when the, the you know, the fractal uh, unbundled and then mm -hmm. it's time for it to bundle uh, again because yeah. of different reasons, either change of direction, change of priorities or, you know, just our reevaluation of what we should be doing. And that's where it gets like super complex and abstract because like you're operating with some crazy stuff. But I think that's that's actually the best way to to describe what's going on. So combining like ants colony uh, emergence, uh, communication through like chemicals and stuff like that, then uh, having analogy of pure like math uh, type of uh, background. And probably there are a couple of more of these that mm -hmm. we're not aware of yet, just because like we are not the, the people that stumbled upon them. Because right. even the ants colony, I wasn't aware of it. Uh, just the guy on the call told me about it. The fractals I was aware of, but I was missing the connection, you know, for the concept to activate in my head. Like, oh, wow, that, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. And the reason why it really activated for me is compass the tool. Okay. Yes. Like, I saw those, you know, individual clusters of people. I started clicking into focus. Have you seen that feature? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wow, those are really, you know, those clusters are fractals that, you know, unbundled and started growing and then start producing even more uh, through yeah. other individuals. And it's, it's really amazing. And this is actually something that I, I had a call with Professor Stipe today. And that was purely like brainstorming and just talking about different things, um, including data. And he actually, like, he helped me formulate some of the things to finish my article. Because mm -hmm. I started article about my personal story, but I ended it about data and, you know, the brave new world stuff, as usual. But <laughs> he helped me formulate some of the thoughts and I included a clip from today's conversation in the article too. And at the end, he actually uh, invited me to this conference, uh, mm. like academic conference. Uh, it's going to be online, obviously, in June. And it's a management type of company, oh, a conference where there's academic approach to management. And I was like, wait, so we can actually start talking about what we're doing yeah. here and give a, a nice, you know, presentation on, on how we observe this happening. And I'm sure mm -hmm. that all of these academics will be amazed, like just to see this as an experiment and yeah. what, what the results are. So um, basically I'll, I'll assemble a team of collaborators, which are like a team that will uh, produce this workshop or something. I still haven't checked into like what, what is the format, but yeah, I mean, it's awesome. Like, yeah, no, that's great. That's exciting. If someone would tell me that I would be collaborating <laughs> with a professor of like social sciences, behavioral change across the world and speaking at the management conference on <laughs> that, like that's insane. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Also has, has really been coming out a lot in talking with AMII and the CodeVid people and co-ventures and, and the folks down in the States um, is realizing the, the gap that's there of having a larger organizational structure that understands the entire ecosystem of all of the different folks who are working on it. And I think that even though that's not something that we necessarily want to take on the entirety of trying to create, I think that if we can help catalyze that happening, that could be a powerful thing. Um, simply so that my hunch is that there's probably a thousand wheels that are getting reinvented right now in a bunch of different areas, as well as vital information that different sets of us have that all of the other ones. Have. Yeah. And I, I, I only recently, oh yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I, I only in the last week or two started actually diving into the Kaggle notebooks a little more to understand how our data is structured. And I think that like, it's great for a Kaggle perspective but we need something that's different. We need something that's an actual catalog that helps people understand, here's the types of data that are available, and here's how it is. And again, we don't have to be the ones who make that. There's other folks like Open Data Initiative and other people who do that, but we should be tapping into that and making sure that there's yeah. a for this and that we're plugged into it. Yeah, and 
actually like there, there is obviously external and internal uh, problem for that. I think the internal one is actually impossible to solve with our brains just because like it is impossible. Right. And right now it's thousand people, but imagine having 10,000 people. Yeah. It's going to be insane. So the only way to handle it is kind of evolutionized through like meta uh, things, mm -hmm. which is going to be tools. Yeah. So to give you an example, instead of uh, like Tyler going to every single introductions message and, you know, routing people, we're going to need to build a system. tool. Yeah, yeah. That does that. Uh, yeah. And like, obviously like imagine that Tyler just decides not to do that anymore. Like mm -hmm. we would have to find a person. First of all, that's time to find a person. Then we have to coach that person to do it. And then there would be a time gap for a person to actually build up the mental model of how he should or should not be doing it. And we just can't afford that on a scale of like thousands of people. Totally. Yeah. So and I think that's where things like Frank is. <coughs> so that's where, yeah, that, that's also something that happened to Frankie's, right? Like there was an actual learning curve to, to do all of that. And the, again, the only real way to, to progress is to offload at least, you know, some of these things to tools, because mm -hmm. even in terms of like asking, wait, so who's doing annotations? Like, right. and no one knows who is doing that. And like, we have to build something that answers these basic Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that if we could take something like the skill lists that people are, are working on, have that be something that anybody can easily plug in and say, you know, yep, here's a whole bunch of the different hard, soft skills that I have, here's the level at which I have those, and then use that same tool for being able to say, here's what I'm looking for, so that it's possible for people to have <coughs> a job description and put out an application and such, people say, like, I need somebody who has this set of three different skills and can speak Chinese and is then able to have the system just match those things up and say, here's the closest fit, and here's five different people who, who you can contact with that. Have you watched that? I think that was that long as five hour call. That, I and, we, and we actually touched on this topic a bit because uh, there was someone who came in and started talking about um, or maybe that was a daily call. I don't remember. But anyways, there was this um, thing about the um, being able to like qualify people for different things, not mm -hmm. just based on their skills, but the actual like experience, you know, yeah. Yeah. when someone does something, you kind of give them a badge, but instead of a badge, there should be something that is continuous property versus yeah. the, the static one. That's so right. As a, as a way, um, I, and we started talking about that, and there are obviously soft skills, and then there are actual work skills, right? Professional skills. And as the way to, to do it, again, I, I always defer to uh, the model that Ray Dalio created, but even though like, he created it and it works for Bridgewater, it doesn't mean it's going to work the same way. Conceptually, right. it's a great uh, model because we can take what works and make it work for us. But essentially, let me share my screen. Uh, essentially, the idea of that dot collector tool is to have kind of like mm -hmm. a way to quickly assess different properties of people, like visionary, you know, or um resilient or doer or connector you know patient you know all of these things and they don't yeah. mean like if you're ranked uh low on patient that's not that that's just you know you and yeah. that's you know your natural abilities and something that you're equipped with so that people can better understand how to uh work with you in in a way so being again being transparent and blunt is good but only as long as you have a very good picture of who's in front of you. Yeah. You know, we're, we're all very different. Mm -hmm. this, this is reminding me also of one of the pieces that I've, I'm, I've floated. <coughs> I might have a little team who will help with doing it. If you're up for it at some point, it would be great. Um, 
part of the <coughs> radical transparency thing, one of the things that feels like it would be useful for us to do is start experimenting with evaluation and not in terms, again, not a top down, here's your boss's evaluation of how you're doing. And sociocracy has an amazing format for that where, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm floating myself as the guinea pig. So I'm trying to find someone who is the equivalent of someone who's the, like the higher circle up in terms of things. And so I want, I'd, I'd like you to take that role. I'm having a couple of people who are working with me on the teams that I'm working on. And then I'm having people who are working on some of the sub teams that I'm working on. And the process is really simple. We're simply, first I describe, here's the places where I feel like I'm excelling. Then, then they're able to, to, they then chip in on what they think is good there. Then I say, here's the places where I feel like I'm falling short. And then they chip in. And then I say, here's, here's my plan in terms of how I'm trying, of how I think I can improve that. And here's the metrics that I'm going to use. <coughs> that's actually changing or not. Mm -hmm. and, and then they help evaluate that. And the goal is not to make this something that's mandatory anytime for anyone, but to simply have a process so that if people are wanting to sort of go through that and have a chance to, to, to do a reality check on, on how they're doing so that they can improve, um, I, I think that that's a great thing. And I feel like the more we can make things like that easy, voluntary, and with a structure that supports it being a positive experience, um, the more we can start refining how we function as a, as a group. Yeah, I would love that. And, you know, it, it's going to be tough because, yeah. you know, it's very unusual. And there is a reason why it takes 18 months for new Bridgewater employees <laughs> to be considered onboarded. It's right. because it's, it's very, very different. Yeah, it's alien. Yeah. Yeah. And like uh, the other screenshot that uh, they showcase is kind of a way for, for people to do it in, in like meetings and, and mm -hmm. stuff to create a matrix. Yeah. And the key here, and I've been thinking about it for years, the key here is actually creating enough structure for people not to think about these kind of qualities or like cards. Remember you sent me the, that card or mm -hmm. whatever? Yeah, so that yeah, people group. can easily retrieve the mental models for each of these qualities and like quickly assess it without overthinking it. Because yeah. the moment when you start thinking, hey, so is Daniel really open-minded or right, right. like assertive or like something, you know? And, like, yeah, you want it to be like a fast from the gut, like, oh yeah, this is something that's there. Yeah. And you know, it won't be 100% correct and right. But right. through crowdsourced in like collective intelligence, it most probably will be. Yeah. <coughs> I'm, I'm excited to see how we can start experimenting a little bit more with that sort of a thing as well. Um, another piece, and again, I, I don't want to keep you too long because I, I do want you to, to make sure that you're able to get your rest. Um, but around, around proposal forming and decision making, I think there's a couple of good pieces that kind of come from that sociocratic model that would be useful for us to experiment with. Um, again, one of the things that's nice with there is it is a fractal model, and so it's one where it makes it really easy to, if you have 10 people or you have 10,000 people, to organize that in a way that information is functionally flowing where it needs to. And it's, it's a circular hierarchical model, so you do, have, um, you do have like a top circle, but information and decision making flows in both directions throughout this whole kind of fractal model that's there. But um, the... The proposal making piece because we're going to start getting to the place where we have to make more decisions mm -hmm. um and the basic hearing of of decisions yeah exactly and, and and so with that and we can talk more in more detail later but the rough thing of it is first you just you define what the problem is you define what the thing is that you're trying to <clears throat> make a decision around and then before you try to leap to solving it you try to figure out like what are the blanks that we need to fill in so you know if, if for example it was the example that we used <coughs> when we're tra we've trained a couple people on it um, is like, it's a library. This is something Diana Lee Christian came up with. So we're trying to make a library. You don't yet try to figure out all the details for it. You say like, so it has to have a place and it has to have a system for taking out the, the books. And we probably have to have some kind of an accountability thing for knowing whether the books are coming back in in good shape. You, you figure out all of the blanks that are there. And then as a group, you quickly work on in going in rounds. You work on trying to fill in those blanks. And then you give it to a couple of people and say, okay, we've come up with a whole bunch of different possible things and they're incoherent and inconsistent. You guys go off for a day or two and you turn that into some kind of a proposal. And then when they bring it back, you then simply, um, you look at it, you see if there's, there's any what are called paramount objections. So not like, I think there could be a better way, but like mm -hmm. 
going to catch fire if we try it this way. And if they're not going to catch fire, then let's give it a go. And how long do we want to try it for? <coughs> what are the metrics we're going to use for whether it's successful or not? And when are we going to reevaluate it? And that way, you, you, like every decision is an experiment that has the validation criteria and a time at which you reassess and tweak if need be. Yeah, and that's what I think about this momentum of the fractal, you know? Yeah. Like, you have to qualify if there is enough momentum to be able to say it's a go. Right. Because essentially you understand, like, for example, that, um, that guy, Vijay, uh, with the smartphone test, that yeah. was really a, a, a test for our structure post submission one because it's a completely different idea. It, uh, it is very detached from what we're doing with Kaggle. And obviously we we'll, would want to encourage him to work on it, but also make him aware that there's probably not enough momentum for him to properly execute on it from different, you know, yeah. Uh, dimensions. Yeah. And, and again, <coughs> it comes to mind of kind of the slime mold where you've got all of the chaotic stuff happening, but then all of a sudden a, a crisis situation happens and then things consolidate and start to make a larger structure. I think similarly internally having it so anybody can be throwing around ideas. We have all of these different pieces, but when it reaches a certain criteria, sort of a, a critical mass, then there start to be criteria where it's like, okay, just talking about it is great. Once we actually are thinking about, do we assign resources to it? That's where there start to be criteria or I'm like, okay, now you have to actually formulate it as a, as a formal project proposal. Mm -hmm. and who's the team who's going to be working on that? And how does that fit in with the overall mandate of what's going on? Um, and so we can have that with a pretty smooth gradient, I think, where, where we, can, we can do the experiment, encourage those experiments, and make sure that they don't become too distracting or take up too many resources before they start to get embedded. Anyways, it's, there's, a lot of, there's an infinite number of things around this kind to, to talk about. Yeah, the, speaking of proposals, I actually remembered what I needed your French language for. So here's uh, some context. Um, after that AI tool call, which I wasn't on, but I listened to it, it became apparent that there is a, an immediate need to help with the uh, papers from different languages. Yeah. And even though we uh, may not want to touch papers from specific countries where you know, there, there is you know, limits to uh, knowledge propagation, and I'm saying that only because this, this call is recorded, but basically we can do that for the countries that are uh, more receptive to things like that. And I remember today that we had a cluster of French papers in okay. 2019, and I assumed that there is you know, mixed quality of results because those are French papers. And I validated it with uh, basically exploring by uh, a word uh, melody or something the disease word in core okay. 19 explorer and oh, yeah, i yeah. did in, indeed get like random results on like the um, uh, right. something sclerosis something and which right. had nothing to do with coronavirus so as a result um i talked with anton and slava to formulate a proposal for um actually identifying these gaps so yeah. he, he uh, created this document based on our discussion, which is proposal for extracting COVID-19 papers in French. So extract relevant COVID-19 relevant, uh, related papers in French from core 19 data sets. So uh, core 19 data sets contain a lot of very loosely related papers to COVID-19. This problem gets exaggerated by having non-English papers in the data set. In particular, there is a big cluster of papers in French language. And this is just a visualization from some other project, but you can clearly see in over how those are, you know, mm -hmm. really French articles. Right. And essentially, like we, uh, we can use exactly what Maya did in her risk factors um, yeah. first submission. It's crazy how, you know, exactly <laughs> the same uh, this approach is, but we can take the engrams um, and basically translate them to French and then we can search for, for them and then we can qualify uh, the results and yeah. like that you know hopefully there is some meaningful result but I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll filter out a bunch of irrelevant stuff and then this is actually a very very important product for any of the 
you know, companies like AI2 or any other research institutions. It can be scaled to any language and it becomes a real news worthy piece too, from the perspectives of, you know, publicity and us delivering mm -hmm. something beyond casual. Yeah. No, and I, I, I like also very much the, the way that that sort of de decentralizes, democratizes, and makes, makes it clear that like it's, it's not all just focused on, on that English piece. Um, I, think, I think we could probably access a bunch <laughs> who would have the right combination of um, bilingualism and medical expertise to be able to, to help with some of that. Um, here in Canada. We, we know a few people who are in the medical community back east, and it tends to be eastern Canada is where it's more more francophone. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, that, I, I really like that idea. It's fantastic. And it seems to be like we already have all the pieces in terms of what Maya created. Yeah, yeah. So it's we just, just need to put like, the new material yeah. into the pipeline. Yeah. Very interesting, again, emergence of, of whatever yeah. we're working on. So yeah, um, probably uh, we'll, we're gonna have a, a call on that tomorrow. So we'll, we'll just see what happens. Okay, that sounds good. At some point, not today, <coughs> keen to talk about ontologies and talk about some of the ways that we could be trying to experiment with or bringing in the people who are working on the sort of knowledge-based reasoning engine side of things. Because my hunch is that there could be some useful things there. In talking with the guy about measuring burn rate in the United States around things like hospital beds, PPE, um, any testing kits, any of those kind of pieces. It struck me that having some kind of a knowledge-based reasoning engine that understands some of the basic properties of the things that are being talked about could make it so that people who are doing his kind of logistical work can ask meaningful questions and get meaningful answers around, around different strategies for how those things get deployed. Yeah, I mean, those discussions in both literature review channel and search engine channel are going very, very deep. Like, okay. like we're, we're getting some heavy, uh, you know, heavy lifters in terms of the, the main expertise joining us. And that's when, like, I'm, I'm feeling extremely uh, overwhelmed to even think about these, uh, like, abstract things. Yeah, I've got a little guy here who I need who who needs some attention. So I'm gonna head. All on. right, um, I'm gonna take some rest and uh, please uh, tweet the um, the the links in inside the article. So the the one that I posted, I actually I'm I'm gonna test two things: the T uh, Tim Berners Lee interview. Yeah. Let's see if that happens, mm -hmm. and the Russell Brent. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that sounds good. And uh, we've started. We're actually we're gonna. <coughs> think doing a bit of a brainstorm on who are some of the different people. Uh, Tyler pointed out Alan Alda would be a perfect person because of the way he speaks Alan Alda, because uh, he, he, does, he does a lot of public stuff. He's used to the public, but, he, but he's curious about a lot of science stuff. He used to work for Scientific American. He's the guy who was in, he was in MASH. Anyways, we'll uh, talk further later on about that. All right. Sounds good. Have a All good right. night. You too. Bye.